Well, we're very fortunate tonight to have Dan Shaw and Tara Periello uh, from um, the Minnesota Board of Water and Soil Resources, and they're going to provide an overview of the state pollinator efforts and an update on the Lawns to Legumes pilot program. I know that this is something that uh, people have expressed a lot of interest in, and I think that uh, as master gardeners, we should be able to speak knowledgeably about this. And uh, I wasn't aware that it was a pilot program, in fact, so that should be interesting. Uh, it's uh, continued to create significant interest from the public in supporting pollinator populations and creating new pollinator habitat. And uh, uh, Dan and Tara are going to discuss uh, ways to be involved and continue to help build momentum on pollinator protection and learn about the technical resources that are available. Uh, Tara is a conservation technician and Dan Shaw is a senior ecologist and vegetation specialist with the Minnesota Board of Water and Soil Resources where he coordinates conservation programs focusing on native vegetation establishment, invasive species management, pollinator habitat, water management, and resiliency to climate change. And he's also uh, taught at the University of Minnesota for the past 18 years. And he's authored or co-authored several publications, including Native Vegetation and Restored Created Wetlands, Plants for Stormwater Design, and the Minnesota Wetland Restoration Guide, and the Blue Thumb Guide to Rain Gardens. So without further ado, Dan and Tara, welcome. Dan and Dan and Tara, well, um, basically, you know, individuals may be um, entering their questions in the chat window. We can save those to the very end if you prefer. That might be more efficient. But if you um, want us to interject along the way, let us know what you would prefer um, with your presentations. Dan, I think you're on mute still. That sounds good. I think if we can save the questions until the end, uh, that sounds good. We'll try to save enough time uh, to go through anybody's questions. That sounds great. And are you familiar with sh the sharing screen option? Yes. Okay, can everybody see that? Okay. Yes. There's uh, just a, it looks like you're sharing, you're sharing your screen, but there's nothing coming up at the present time. Okay. It's just black. I'm gonna try that again. <laughs> There it goes. You can see that okay? Yes, sir. Okay, great. All right, well, uh, we'll get started. So uh, we wanted to first give an introduction to some of the state efforts that are going on and give a bigger picture view of pollinator restoration work within the state of Minnesota, and then talk about how the Lawns to Legumes program works and how that fits in to this bigger picture of conservation. Tara and I work for the Minnesota Board of Water and Soil Resources, and this is a state agency that's focused on improving Minnesota's water and soil resources, and we work in partnerships with local organizations to accomplish our goals. Uh, we've restored around 260,000 acres of habitat over the last 26 years. Recent research and information coming in about insects and their decline has been alarming for ecologists and conservationists. Uh, some of the papers that we've been looking at have been showing more than 40% of insect species are declining. And so it's not only pollinators, it's a wide range of insects that are in decline around the world. And there's been some um, big estimates of what the potential biomass might be over time. 
And much of this is happening in um, more tropical areas, but it's also occurring in temperate landscapes as well. There's also been information about declining bird populations. Um, um, the estimate is that there's about 3 billion less birds in North America since 1970. And many of these birds that are in decline are birds that eat insects. <laughs> so there are birds like warblers and sparrows that rely on insects and caterpillars for part of their life cycle. And so if those insects are declining, then it has an impact on these bird populations. <clears throat> With our work, we see really close ties between the work we do for pollinators, climate change, and water quality. And I, I think that's a real positive because we can combine the benefits for these aspects or these challenges that we're facing within these landscapes. Uh, aquatic landscapes are a good example where we can focus on plants that clean water, they're sequestering carbon, they're providing habitat for pollinators, dragonflies, and other insects. And so these types of plantings can play a really important role. We had an executive order uh, last year from Governor Walls uh, that's focused on pollinator protection. And executive orders play an important role in bringing agencies together to get agencies coordinating on different topics that are at need. And so that was an important step to continue work of an interagency pollinator protection team. Also last year, the rusty patch bumblebee became Minnesota's state bee. And the rusty patch bumblebee is the first bee in the nation, the first, um, the first bumblebee in the nation to be on the federal endangered species list. And so that's pretty significant and it, is a species that is found in the Twin Cities area. Uh, some of its larger populations still remain within this area. And so it was a really good uh, species for us to be focusing on with the Lawns and Legumes program. People really recognize the importance of supporting this bee and recognizing that urban plantings can play a significant role in helping this federally endangered species. We have different resources that we've been working on uh, with the Board of Water and Soil Resources. We have a pollinator plan that was first developed back in 2013 and it's continued to be updated as we've adjusted our plans for how to benefit pollinators with our programs. We also have a pollinator toolbox that's been a popular resource that helps people think through pollinator projects beginning with funding options uh, site preparation, planting methods, species selection. Uh, so there's a lot of information within this pollinator toolbox. Generally with between state agencies, we're very focused on trying to find ways to get pollinator habitat into a really wide range of habitats across the state. Uh, solar is a good example where we have a habitat solar program, which is one of our newer bands birds within these solar installations. Uh, but really we're looking across landscapes for these opportunities to incorporate pollinator habitat. Um, some other programs that we focus on with our agency, uh, Conservation Reserve Enhancement Pro Program, CREP, is one of our larger programs and that's where we have over 250,000 acres of easements that have been restored for habitat and water quality. Uh, we have different wetland programs. Um, we think we have a new program starting, a strategic pollinator and beneficial insect program um, that's been recommended for LCCMR funding. Our habitat friendly solar program and the new lawns to legumes program which started last year. With our larger landscape efforts, uh, we tend to partner with other agencies. So it might be Minnesota DNR, it could be Christian Wildlife Service, could be NRCS. So uh, I think that's a real positive of something that happens in Minnesota that we work together to try to identify where the greatest needs are for habitat for different species around the state, and then try to connect up 
important corridors and habitat complexes uh, through these efforts. And so that on a bigger picture, larger landscape scale is something that's happening across Minnesota. Uh, agencies also have state seed mixes. We have about 70 of them right now and are in the process of updating these seed mixes. They're uh, for different uses, for shoreline buffers, for pollinator habitat. We have landfill cap mixes. We have a really wide range of seed mixes that we've been developing for specialized uses to try to get higher quality habitat into a wide, wide range of um, landscapes. The Habitat Solar Program is still relatively new. It's a way for solar companies to uh, get recognition for establishing pollinator habitat within their projects. Um, I think we're still learning a lot about exactly how to do this effectively, but it is something that a lot of different agencies and partners are working hard on to figure out of how best to establish and maintain this quality habitat on these sites. Um, there's some other resources we've been working on. Um, pesticide drift has been a concern with conservation plantings and it's true with these solar projects as well. So we, we've been thinking about how do we best uh, prevent impacts to pollinators on our conservation lands because quite often we do have agricultural uh, lands adjacent to our conservation planting. So how do we think about that um, as far as minimizing any potential impacts. And we also have a featured plant article that we do every month. We focus on species that are important for our conservation work. Um, if you're interested in getting these featured plant articles, you can go to Bowser's website and sign up um, to receive the featured plant articles but we also have guest authors write these. So if any of you are interested in writing a featured plant article, definitely get in touch with me and we would welcome your involvement with these uh, featured plant articles. Um, I, I think it's a really good way to um, have different expertise from uh, people around the state writing these articles about species. We tend to have a running list of species that we want to work on in the future and then we try to link up guest authors with these articles. Well, I'm going to stop sharing and turn it over to Tara. Can I share my screen, Darren? Yes. Pardon? Um, do you see in the very bottom the green oh, that's uh, right shared screen option? Does that yep. show up for you? Yep, I guess I just am not used to seeing um, all the screens come up at the same time. <laughs> uh, so, does this work? Or you can see it? It, it does, yes, it's okay. great. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, as Dan mentioned, I um, work for uh, Board of Water and Soil Resources, and I started in uh, this past January 2020. So I've been really excited to be a part of this program. Um, we are partnering with Blue Thumb uh, to help run the individual support component of the program. and. Blue Thumb is a public-private partnership that has over 50 organizations working together to really spread the same message um, across the state that talking about reducing runoff and improving water quality. And Metro Blooms runs Blue Thumb, and Metro Blooms is a nonprofit that promotes gardening and beautifying our communities. And I want to just point out um, at the bottom all the partners that have been involved in the Lawn Silly Games program have really helped to, um, over the last year to be a part of it. So this is a pilot program that started in June 2019. So it's only a year old, a little bit over a year. 
The funding comes from the um, Environment and Natural Resource Trust Fund. And the program focus is to establish pollinator habitat projects on residential landscapes across Minnesota to support the rusty patch bumblebee and other pollinators. So with the program, there's three different components. There's the public education and outreach um, campaign. There's the individual landowner support and demonstration neighborhoods. There's been a lot of excitement um, and coverage over this past year. Um, one of the neat things about the program is that the pilot program allows both renters and residential landowners to both participate um, in the the two types of grants, um, as you can see, are the individual landowner support and the demonstration neighborhood um, components. We have granted out the majority of that funding for this year, um, but we're continuing to let folks know about the technical resources that are available. And, um, and as money, or, and we're also continuing to look for um, additional funding. So over this past year, there's been a lot of workshops held uh, to landowners and the workshops are really focusing on the conservation challenges, creating pollinator habitat and resiliency, the stacked benefits of pollinator projects. And we talk further about the program details and then just um, teaching folks where to find the resources. So um, on the left is the, the Bowser website and on the right is the Blue Thumb website. So those two are kind of inter interchanged on certain parts of it. In the program, um, through the program, a couple items have been created. And so there's the, on the left is the planting for pollinators, um, the principles for design residential pollinator habitat. And this really guides people from the beginning of a project to the end of a project and gives really great insights and kind of talks about um, if it's a beginner gardener project or if it's one that's a little bit more advanced. Uh, and there's a lot of great resources in there. So that's available on our website. And then we have on the right side our um, different planting template. So this is an example of a shade garden template. And so what is um, a legume? So the legumes are flowering plants that fix nitrogen in the ground. And the native plants that are legumes um, that we have are the photos of the purple prairie clover, milk fetch, lead plant. And then there is the white Dutch clover um, that's often found in the bee lawn. So you'll see that. And we do have, uh, you know, there are a number of great uh, native plants out there, but there are some that are, you know, more particular to the different insects and um, pollinators. And so these plants are um, geared more towards the rusty patch bumblebee. And so in this piece, there are um, kind of a combination of the spring blooming. So we have the columbine and the Virginia bluebells. There's, you know, the midsummer is the um, wild bergamot, the giant hyssop. Some of the blazing stars, and then in the fall is the goldenrod and asters. Those are great ones to have in your garden. I'm going to just kind of go um, over the next, the four types of projects or practices that we're um, working on for the lawns to legumes. But I just thought this was a cute photo. Um, on the left is a um, a photo that one of the individual support landowners sent in. Um, they're starting their project and getting kids involved. And on the very left, you can see the project. They're kind of expanding um, in a native pocket garden, but kind of removing some turf. So a little bit of all ages involved. So these are the four types of practices that uh, for lawns to legumes. And so as I was mentioning, you know, there's plants or projects for beginning gardeners or more advanced. And so I'll kind of go through that as I talk about each one individually. Um, one of the key pieces is really just, you know, 
as you're going about your, if whichever one you're going to decide, you know, kind of assessing your site, um, considering how you use that space, what the sunlight looks like, um, the, the shade, considering also if there's any city ordinances for your property. Um, so that sometimes factors into what project would be best. And then also factoring in the site preparation and maintenance is a little different for each of these practices. And then, um, what was I gonna so this first one is the native pocket planting. And so this is recommended for new gardeners. You, know, you can start with a 10 foot by 10 foot garden or even five foot by five foot if you, need, if you wanted to. Um, and that's a way to, um, to start, like you could go in the corner of your property or spots that you don't always go to except for maybe to mow. That's another way to start. This photo is showing um, they removed some turf up by their front doorstep and um, looks fairly nice. So a lot of folks start these projects um, with plugs or larger size containers versus a seed. I wanted to just show an example of, you know, another template that was sent to us uh, from somebody at Wild Ones. And so I just thought it was a neat visual um, to show like the front, the middle, the back of a garden, and then it's sectioned out by the months. So when these plants bloom and to get another idea of, um, of placement. And so that's one of the things we're really teaching folks is having um, plants blooming throughout the whole season. There are three different variations of the pocket gardens. And so rain gardens is one of the um, variations. And so a rain garden is just a simple flat bottom bowl. Um, there's more construction to it, but it's a maximum of 12 inches depth. It's gonna soak in water for um, two days and then it will dry out again. Um, so there are plants, native plants, that can be um, placed in the rain gardens that will help filter that water uh, and provide food for pollinators. There is also the boulevard gar gardens. So a lot of boulevards are um, convex and like raised up, but you can remove, you know, two to three inches of soil to kind of lower it, allow the water that's running off to kind of soak in. Um, and so this is a space that a lot of people are, are planting in the photos, um, strawberries, but you can do other um, plantings as well. Then the third variation is shoreline buffers. And so a shoreline planting is a great um, practice to help filter any pollutants that are going straight to the lake. So um, sometimes folks mow right up to that edge of the water, but the, the turf grass has two to three inch deep roots. Um, and there's a lot of erosion that could happen at the edge. And so having native plants that have a deeper root system helps to hold that soil in place. And then it also helps filter anything that's coming, you know, from uphill down towards the river. So these are kind of, um, you know, larger scale plantings, but you can start with five feet, 10 feet wide, and that's a really great um, starting point. The second practice is the uh, trees and shrubs. So these are, again, recommended for new gardeners because you can really play with the different sizes and shapes, um, you know, textures of the trees with how it fits into your property. And so these are just great examples of um, plants that would have good pollinator resources. And then the third practice is the pollinator lawn. And so these are the nomo or the fine fescues that have a lower growing um, or have the grass, the nomo grass look, where it's kind of like the rough at a golf course, but having it intermixed with um, some flowers. And so a lot of folks do put in that self heal or the white clover or violets. And that also is a way to reduce mowing and your gas and any fertilizer. And this is another project that 
is maybe recommended for more experienced gardeners. Um, and so it's a, it's a one to start maybe again in the side of your property that you're not always going, um, or it can be a transition if you did that shoreline buffer, it could be that shoreline buffer, the pollinator lawn, and then your other lawn that you recreate in. So there's a lot of great options for this. And then the fourth uh, practice is the pollinator meadow. And so these are large plantings of, of diverse and native plants. This is often built with using plugs or larger containers as well. And this is a photo of an urban area. Um, this would be, I guess, recommended for a more advanced gardener as well. There's also the pollinator meadow where it's a larger scale, more of an acreage or, or so. And so that's where, if you were to do that scale of a, set, of a project, you'd want to consider using a seed mix because that would be a lot cheaper. Um, so there's a lot mm -hmm. of different maintenance regimes too to, to work through in planning as well. In the program, um, we're asking for projects no, no greater than three acres. Um, and then I just wanted to give a little bit of general maintenance recommendations, you know, for any project that you're starting to, um, to water it at least one inch per week, pulling those weeds and keeping debris out of the project just so all the plants get sunlight and then replacing mulch as it's need needed. And over time, you won't need as much mulch, as much mulch, I can say, um, <laughs> because the plants will really grow in and uh, you'll kind of only need to put it in, on in the spring and kind of be done. And then there's the maintenance uh, during the growing season. So, you know, some folks are out in their garden all the time. Some, you know, just need some key dates like Memorial Day, July 4th, and Labor Day. Those are kind of some key points to remember. Um, that's when you start to see the dandelions coming up and start maybe seeing some weeds start getting going to seeds, so um, good visuals. And so just reminding, you know, pulling weeds, dividing plants, that's another way to just kind of keep expanding what you have if, you, if you're really enjoying it. Um, you can expand and um, kind of work with the shapes of your, your property. Um, always inspecting your project for if there's any erosion or anything that's happening. And then in the spring to cut back plants, um, starting to kind of, instead of just cutting everything back, start considering leaving a little bit for some, some stems for the pollinators. I'm going to just touch on um, the next components here. So this is just a visual of showing, you know, these are the three different components, but everyone is um, able to access the technical resources that are available. So all created for everybody, even if if there wasn't grant funding. So the public outreach um, and education campaign is really about raising awareness about pollinator habitat and the importance of creating habitat across the state, increasing awareness about those technical resources that allow residents to build projects on their own. And then we, we are working with the Minnesota College of Art and Design on social media content, uh, graphics, and the editorial calendar. In the bottom right is a um, some artwork from the MCAD students. So if you follow us on social media, you'll see um, that there's a lot of different artwork that we've been posting to help promote the program. And then Blue Thumb has been doing the same. The individual support component has the cost share, workshops, coaching, uh, the technical resources. And this year we did have uh, two rounds that closed. Um, so we had a big push at the end of February, and then we had another round, a big push at the beginning of June. We had over 7,500 people that applied, which is really a great, you know, a lot of interest around the whole state. We've actually had over 100 coaches sign up statewide, and then close to 2,000 people that attended workshops.
So lots of exciting um, excitement. Some of the, um, the key pieces I just wanted to mention. So folks that were awarded um, the $350 grants they're being asked to keep their project in the ground for up to three years. Um, choosing those three, three plants that are blooming each season, using local native vegetation and protecting projects from pesticides. And then in the end, they're collecting um, and submitting before and after images, receipts and providing match. And so we'll know in the future if there's um, some additional grant funding that's not been used we'll be able to reallocate some of that. So not, there's people that everyone are starting to submit receipts. And so we're starting to see maybe a little bit what's not getting used, um, but it's getting a lot of great examples coming in. Wanted to point out, so for the coaches, we have volunteer coaches that have been working with all of the grantees for the individual component section. And the coaches, uh, have been working with three to five different awarded grantees and we did we held a bunch of uh, train the trainer workshops and we did a large coaching webinar. Um, right now we're in need of coaches more in western Minnesota but we may need more um, next season as the program continues if we're awarded more funding and so you can sign up on the Blue Thumb website if you're interested because we definitely will need more coaches in the future. And so there has been adjustments this year due to COVID, um, but generally we would be at, you know, workshops, tabling events. Um, a lot of it is virtual at the moment. I just wanted to show you a couple um, photos quick of a, a couple projects that came in. So this was a pocket planting um, that is um, a pocket planting that was, they removed the turf at the top of the hill and then also the, um, they added more native plantings along the top. And so you can see that they're starting to help stabilize that um, hillside. So that's a great example. And then this is my last one that um, is kind of a, a good before and after. You can see on the left side of the before is just a lot of turf grass in the backyard, you know, maybe some spots that they're not always recreating in. And so the grant allowed them to kind of to put some pocket plantings in, in the corner. They, you know, the, the fence is painted, so that's trying to face the photos the same way. They added some trees and um, kind of providing habitat in their, their property. So that's all I have for this. And then I'm gonna pass this on to Dan next. So let me stop sharing. All right, thank you, Tara. <clears throat> If I uh, pick, pick the right option here to share, can everybody see my screen right now? Yes, it's, it's uh, showing up. <clears throat> okay, great. <clears throat> okay, so I'll uh, um, be talking about the demonstration neighborhoods part of the program. So uh, Tara mentioned the individual support. Uh, the demonstration neighborhoods were community-wide projects. Uh, these were developed through a request for proposal process and we had watershed districts, conservation districts, cities, counties, tribes, and nonprofits that were eligible to apply for these funding. And their role was to work with the individual recipients um, or the uh, residents uh, within these neighborhoods and they were eligible for between twenty and forty thousand dollars for these projects. Uh, the real focus of this is on building demonstration projects within important pollinator corridors within the states. We're trying to make important connections for the rusty patch bumblebee and other at-risk species 
with these demonstration neighborhood projects. <clears throat> uh, so this is a graphic that shows uh, what we were looking for with these types of projects that we're trying to have connections of habitat within neighborhoods and in many cases benefiting more natural areas that are connected to these neighborhoods and making bigger areas of habitat. <clears throat> Some of the really small bees don't fly very far. They'll go like 30 meters in a day uh, for their flight distance and so they really need interconnected habitat. Other bees like honeybees will go much further but we're trying to benefit a wide range of species and we have about 450 native bees in the state and they all have different needs. Um, so really we're trying to um, address the needs of all of these different species. Similar to the individual support program, we had uh, requirements for funding with this program. Um, the applicants, we left it up to them to just determine what a neighborhood would be. And so we do have a lot of variation in what is being considered a neighborhood for this program. <laughs> we had a maximum acreage size for projects. We focus on the four planting types that Tara talked about. Um, there's a focus on Minnesota native plants, um, decreasing pesticide use, having a, at least a five year long agreement for these projects, and then there was a match requirement. This shows where the demonstration neighborhood projects were located with this first pilot phase of the program. We had 34 applications that came in for this phase of the program. <laughs> um, I think there's been building interest with this. So if we have another round in the future, we'll see more and more of these around the state. But this has been a great start having these demonstration neighborhoods in different parts of the state. Um, in, in Sherburne County, uh, they're focused around a lake and doing some water quality work in addition to pollinator benefits, which I, I think is a great link for this program to focus on water quality in addition to providing the habitat. <clears throat> and these projects are pretty new. Here they're planting a pollinator meadow, but it's been very encouraging to see the momentum with these groups, the excitement around these projects with the applicants and the individual residents that are working on these projects. Um, so it's great to see all of the work that's getting accomplished. Uh, down by Winona, we have a project and they're working uh, within a coulee. They've been doing some bluff restoration, but are also doing pollinator plots and pollinator meadows as part of their effort. Um, they're, they've been seeing the rusty patch bumblebee. So this is you know, really encouraging. This is a different scale than some of our neighborhoods that are more urban, but you know, I think it is a great way to build uh, community within these types of areas as well, in addition to uh, providing pollinator habitat. <clears throat> uh, this was one of the smaller projects within that uh, program with uh, Winona. Um, and this was somebody who wanted to plant a garden in memory of their grandmother who really loved butterflies and worked hard to do plantings to benefit butterflies. So I think it's, it's just a good example that these plantings go beyond benefits to pollinators. You know, there's these water quality benefits, but there's also human benefits. You know, these can be very meaningful uh, plantings for people also. As part of our outreach that Tara was talking about, we have been highlighting some of the outcomes of the program. Uh, we did have a feature in the Oprah magazine, which was exciting. You know, it doesn't happen with conservation programs very often. Um, so it was great to see this program mentioned uh, in the Oprah magazine. Uh, we've had, um, I believe it's over 2,000 people attend workshops, which is a pretty significant number, around 33,000 people have visited our website for the resources that are up on the website. Um, and so there's, there's definitely been a lot happening with this program over the, the past year. You know, it's about a year old. And so um, it's been great to see the involvement with the public. And really a lot of it has been through social media. You know, it seems like that's where this program really gained momentum. Um, the workshops have been really helpful. 
And actually the workshops are a really good opportunity for master gardeners to get involved because we have um, design workshops where residents split up at tables and then master gardeners um, are there to help the residents with some of their planning for projects. And so that is an opportunity for master gardeners to, to get involved with this program. Um, we have been recommended for additional funding through LCCMR. Um, so we're very hopeful that we'll be able to continue another round of this program in the future. <clears throat> Uh, social media has played a really important role for this program. Um, been using Facebook, Twitter, Instagram for all of these uh, for this program, and you know that's been very effective as um, a form of outreach, getting people to um, know what the program is about, share thoughts about the program, and really build a lot of excitement. Um, I mentioned we've had about 33,000 people visit the website in the past year. That's about half of the capacity of the U.S. Bank Stadium. So that's uh, um, very exciting for us as well. You know, we put a lot of hard work into the resources that are on that page, the planting templates. There's a, a planting guide that's on that page too, which has been um, something that people have found very useful for uh, planning for pollinator plantings. <clears throat> and for the individual support, there's been applications that have come in from 84 of Minnesota's 87 counties. Um, so that's also very encouraging that this has become a statewide program uh, versus just a uh, Twin Cities focused program. <clears throat> uh, as far as building momentum in the future and future steps, uh, we'll continue working on engaging the public uh, through collaboration with partners. Uh, Tara mentioned that we have a large number of partners involved in this program. And uh, those partnerships have been very important for getting the word out about opportunities with the program. <clears throat> uh, we'll be focusing outreach on the value of residential plantings to support pollinators. Uh, we feel strongly that all these smaller plantings really do add up to provide important pollinator habitat and then build on this uh, pilot effort into the future. Um, we, so we have been recommended for additional funding through LCCMR. We're gonna be looking for additional funding sources uh, to really um, reach this program as far as we can. <clears throat> uh, within our website, if you go to our pollinator habitat page, there's a link on the left side to lawns and legumes. You can also, get there by doing a web search for Bowser Lawns to Legumes. You should be able to get there pretty quickly um, as a, another way to get to that web page. Sometimes it's a little <laughs> hard to find just by going to our web page, and that's why we wanted to show how to get there um, on this page. Um, one other part of the program is that um, we have a lot of people that are doing projects on their own, even without get, receiving funding from us. And we've wanted to be able to recognize people who have been doing that. And there is a page on the Blue Thumb uh, Planting for Clean Water website for mapping existing projects or projects where people have done their own work um, with, with pollinator habitat. <laughs> um, and so if you go to this web page, um, there's you know map your completed project, and then there's a reimbursement option if you're uh, getting reimbursed for um, a planting. But if you've done a project on your own, there's an option for doing that also. <clears throat> um, so as far as moving ahead, um, and we definitely need help spreading the word about pollinator resources <laughs> that are available for projects, all the planting templates and planting guidance that is available on the Lawns and Legumes website. Um, we're encouraging people to map their habitat projects. It, it also helps build support for the program if we can so show legislators and others the number of people who are planting projects on their own versus just the ones we were able to fund. Um, it shows the larger impact of the program. Um, we're asking people working on these projects to help track their Rusty Patch Bumblebee sightings through Bumblebee Watch org and iNaturalist. Those are apps that are available um, 
um, to have on phones and can be a really good way to document what you're seeing on plantings. And then also following and sharing Bowser on social media. So that brings us to the end of our uh, presentation. So we um, should have some time left for questions. Thank you uh, both Dan and Tara for your presentation. And uh, I can follow up with you after your presentation if there's any, if you wanna share your presentations or any of the information with the Master Gardeners, I can get that out with a follow-up email. But I think this call to action uh, slide is an excellent one for master gardeners to uh, consider um, as they might want to get involved in the future. If anyone does have questions, they're um, welcome to uh, share their uh, questions either in the chat or uh, we can try to get you on um, by uh, you know, verbally asking the speakers as well. Um, I do see one question in the chat. Um, do you know the demographics of your landowner grant recipients and uh, Let's see. Yeah, just kind of background and who's been in getting involved with your programs. Uh, I, I can start with uh, with that question, and um, we do have some demographic information. Um, you know, the I think the well, the main information we have is the location of where the recipients are located. Um, there is an equity part to this program as well. Um, there were some extra points um, given as part of the ranking that was used um, using the Pollution Control Agency's equity maps. And so that was uh, something that was considered as part of this program. Um, and so, um, you know, we have a fair amount of information about where people are located uh, that are recipients. And, um, you know, we had a large number that were within these equity areas that were lower income, uh, racially diverse or tribal areas within the state. <clears throat> and that was also uh, something that we've seen with the demonstration neighborhoods uh, part of the program as well. Um, partly because nonprofits were part of the applicants for those demonstration neighborhood grants. And many of them have been working in uh, more diverse neighborhoods um, within the Twin Cities. Um, there's one tribe that's involved. And so it's been encouraging, you know, to see the, um, the equity side of this program and, uh, you know, really a, a pretty wide distribution of where the recipients are. We'd like to see more around the state moving ahead. And that's something that we're talking more about as part of a phase two of this program. Uh, we just want to make sure that, you know, equity continues to be a key part of what we're doing. Well, Dan and Terry, I see a question about the seed sourcing. I know sometimes there's a concern on where seeds are coming from on the projects around the state. Is that much of a, a priority with this program or where are you getting the, the seeds for um, execution of the lawns and legumes? I, I can answer that one too. Um, so with all of our state programs, we have um, requirements for using local seed um, to the extent possible. Um, and so that means local origin seed, seed that originates close to the project site if possible. Um, we have flexibility working out from the project site. Um, the reasoning for the, the focus on local seed is that um, we feel that plants are better adapted, you know, if they're locally um, um, sourced for the for the seed, um, for um, plant plant materials being used for projects. Um, there's also some concern with some of the native plants of moving genetics around too much that it can impact the uh, genetics of local populations of plants. And so we do have general um, guidance on that. That you know we're looking for local sources to the extent possible. Um, you know, the reality is we only have so many seed vendors around the state and, and plant growers around the state. Um, so there are limits to how local is local. And, you know, um, when running a program, you know, we, um, you know, set these guidelines and, um, you know, do the best we can to accomplish these goals for uh, using local sources. Great. Thank you. 
I do see a specific question regarding uh, <clears throat> Hillcrest Golf Course. Um, I guess, uh, Brenda, we, we, we need to know where that golf course is located and if it's possibly a local watershed district or county might be working with that. Basically, the comment was they're working with uh, some open space and restored wetlands. And yeah. It is um, in Greater East St. Paul, um, and it's it's uh, 100, 115 acres. It's close to the size of the Ford um, oh. development. It's by Beaver Lake. Um, that might be Barbara a Ramsey, and McKnight. Yeah, like a Ramsey Washington Metro yes, watershed yeah. project. <laughs> Um, yep. Yeah, it would be Ramsey for sure. It's it's um, Greater East St. Paul and um, uh, Maplewood. Yeah, we don't have that one in, or we're not involved in that one uh, for the Lawn Sale Games program. Yeah, there could be other Bowser grants right. that might be yeah. uh, working with that program though, because we do uh, work with watershed districts uh, on a regular basis on those types of projects. <clears throat> Um, Dan and Tara, there was a question about, uh, do you have suggestions for um, local seed sources? I know there's a variety of different sites on there in the state that has kind of those clearing houses of, kind of native plant suppliers and seed suppliers, but do you have recommendations on sites for master to visit? Yeah, on our website, on the Bowser website, um, on the Lawn Sale Games page, there's a couple links for the DNR uh, vendor list or the ah. nursery list and so there's a lot of spots around the whole state um, and then there's also a link to the wild ones brochure that lists a bunch of native um, plant vendors and we we do talk about um, for folks in the last leg talking about not using neonics and so that is a it is brought up to not do that or to ask their um, wherever they're purchasing their plants to ask if it's using that. Um, that the plants for lawn legumes, there are a couple of cultivars that we do allow um, for trees. There's the service berry and the hawthorn. Um, and then some of the, the flowering mix for the bee lawn is not native, but the rest of it that anybody installs is, uh, we're asking that it is Minnesota native plants. Yeah, and, that, and that's for the reimbursement um, side of it. Residents can add other species into these plantings if they want to, you know, if they want to use hostas or something as an edging plant, you know, that's their decision to do that. Um, we can't reimburse for those plants, but when it comes to design and how these are laid out, you know, there's all kinds of options. And just as a note, I'm making note of some of these questions as well, and I can share some of these resources in the follow-up email, so you'll have a link to some of these uh, questions that you're asking this evening. Any other questions for our presenters? I'm just wondering how you're measuring your results then. Um, what were those plans? Well, we, oh, I say, we, were, we do have the ability in the end um, to compile, you know, the square footage of what projects have been installed um, for, between all the four different practice types. And then the the pro or the square footage installed, and so we're able to kind of give a size um, and kind of know that amount that is being covered. And then the Bumblebee Watch and iNaturalist do have some lawn legumes pages too that are also um, linked in there. But that's a a piece to it, small piece yeah. in the, the mapping. The uh, the end. The insect side is challenging because, you know, I mentioned we have around 450 species of bees. And so we can't expect the residents to identify all these bees <laughs> that are showing up. Um, you know, in some cases, you know, we're using bumblebees as surrogates as, as a indicator of uh, quality habitat. You know, and generally um, pollinator experts see that as a pretty 
um, good um, gauge of, of how good of habitat it has been established by uh, tracking some of the bumblebee species that are showing up. Um, uh, we definitely do want reports though of people who have seen rusty patch bumblebee or other species they've identified on projects and I think that'll be part of what we'll be gathering moving ahead are some of these accounts of what people have observed on their properties. Uh, we, we've been talking with researchers about developing a survey as well uh, that could be used and be sent out to the recipients for this program partly to gauge how things went for them with the program and get their ideas for improvement, but it could also collect some information about observations uh, with wildlife with these plantings. Do you have any kind of um, program planned, say for uh, Channel 2 that gives a big picture view of your project so that people can get even more excited when they see how it fits into the big picture of pollinator habitat and wetlands in Minnesota. You know, I think um, uh, the thought of being part of a large effort to restore insects and birds and uh, wetlands would, would really turn people on. So just a suggestion. Yeah, I think that's a great idea and you know our communications staff are always looking for opportunities to um, reach a larger audience with these um, with this kind of a program and I think you know channel two would be a great way to do that if we can figure out how to um, become a part of one of the programs um, that they have uh, we, we have you know done quite a few interviews um, both ra um, radio interviews and um, some television and so uh, we've you know we've had some opportunities but I think you know a larger program would be a good way to really build the momentum because uh, you know ultimately that's our goal with this program is that we want this to become commonplace <laughs> that people um, you know see this as something that is really important to have within their landscapes and in order to accomplish that, we need to find ways to reach a really large audience. <laughs> and, you know, and there almost has to be some peer pressure that, you know, the people without this habitat are the ones that are missing out. Um, so finding ways to, to reach this larger audience, I think, is going to be really important. Yeah, because I think the first thing people were excited about was the idea of being reimbursed for doing these plantings. And I... I think that you'd get more people excited about doing them without any reimbursement if they saw how they fit into the big picture. Yeah, I, I would agree. You know, the it's great to have the funding, but when we have funding, you know, we recognize that there's only so many people that are going to be able to receive this funding. And so from the beginning with this program, we tried to build it in a way that had all the resources and it had as much outreach to reach people who wanted to do projects on their own as possible because that we realized that was going to be our biggest impact potentially. Um, so trying to broaden the awareness and the recognition of the importance of this kind of work, you know, that's I, I think our, our key next step. Yeah. Well, Jen and Ty, I see a question that just came in. Um, are you working with the University of Minnesota Bee Squad? And I'm sure you're probably working with a lot of entomology type programs around the state, but do you have any uh, responses to that? Yeah, they've been very helpful uh, to us as advisors of this program. You know, Marla Spivak um, plays an important role. Elaine Evans um, there also, she was part of our advisory uh, team for this program and helping with the demonstration neighborhood grants. Ian Lane with the Bee Lab is another expert that's been providing guidance. And um, one thing we've been talking about is um, moving ahead is having an adopt the pollinator program. And Ian has been giving ideas about, you know, what species we could select um, for that kind of a program. And we, we wanna potentially select species where there's key plants they rely on and trying to match up the species and the plants. So, just the concept at this stage, but those are the kinds of things that we've been working with the Bee Lab on um, to get their input and ideas. I'd encourage you to uh, keep 
the Master Gardener, Gardener program in mind, um, not only just for helping to spread the word with education outreach, um, but also just uh, <coughs> on the ground action, whether it's you know demonstration projects on our own yards, or uh, I think some of the Master Gardeners are involved with some of the coaching as well. So uh, this is a great group of people. So uh, keep us in mind as you continue to develop this program and other programs within Bowser and a lot of the other agencies. Yeah, we really appreciate the partnership with Master Gardeners. You know, it's great to have a large group of knowledgeable people that can work with residents. You know, that's been a really important part for this program through the coaching, through the workshops. Um, I, I think we will find more opportunities moving ahead in the future to partner with Master Gardeners. Uh, you know, as we focus on these water quality projects, pollinator plantings, um, so I, I think that'd be great if we can continue to look for opportunities to uh, partner between agencies in the Master Gardener program. Great. Well, I'll work with uh, both of you to uh, kind of collect some of the resources and get them out to the uh, Master Gardener volunteers. And we uh, definitely thank you for uh, joining us this evening for sharing this update in the program. And it's exciting to see what's going on across our landscapes across Minnesota and here in the metro area. So thank you again. And uh, thank you to all the, the volunteers for joining us on this beautiful summer evening and uh, enjoy, enjoy the rest of your evening and thanks. Oh, thank you. Thank you.